Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The title of the book is Dear Princess Grace, Dear Betty, The Memoir of a Romantic Feminist. The author is the feminist, social critic, as well as passionate advocate, Alita Brill, and she's my guest today. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me again, Ronnie. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here. It's lovely. I love the book. Thank you. What I love is hearing about people, their lives, what helped make them what they are, and how you lived through the whole thing. I mean, I loved starting with your parents, who sounded incredible, who died very old. How old were they? My mother died in my father's arms exactly one month to the day on Friedan's birth and death date, one month before she was 101. And my father died three months and 15 days later. Um, Isn't that something? Because he couldn't possibly go on without her. And they were very much in love. Always. Yeah. Always. So interesting. So you grew up with the fantasies. I wanted to be a nurse, a Navy nurse. I grew up during the Second World War. But you wanted to be an actress. And Princess Grace. And Princess Grace. I wanted to be both an actress, a princess, and <laughs> in control. <laughs> <laughs> and I often think that I want, as I, as I grew older and confessed my love of Princess Grace and the fact that I actually wrote a letter to her, I think I wanted to believe that this little girl wanted to be Princess Grace because she was a princess and a working actress, but no, not really the case. <laughs> of course, she never worked again once right. she married Rene. He wouldn't her. let her. Yeah, yeah. He let her. So then you, you, but all of your life, you also always looked for romance. I was obsessed with romance. Well, is that because you had such a good example with your parents? I'm not sure, because they certainly were not happy with this obsession of mine. And in fact, I lied to my mother when I wanted to write the letter to Princess Grace and said I wanted to collect stamps because my mother did not want me to be so obsessed. I think it had something to do with living under this shadow or within proximity of Hollywood. You know, I grew up in a, in a Southern California town that was about an hour up the freeway from Hollywood and Hollywood influenced us. I write in the book about when Marilyn Monroe committed suicide it was an international event, but in Lakewood, Long Beach, California, it was a neighborhood event. And I think a lot of it was the influence of Hollywood, and you were right there, and you could go any time, and you'd see the Hollywood sign and the Grauman's Chinese. And, and it was really small potato stuff in the yeah. 1950s compared right. to the Hollywood of today. But I don't think my parents influenced me. They were a great love affair, but they weren't, they weren't fantasy people. Mm. They were both people that had suffered greatly, great losses. I think it was the influence of movies. Isn't that interesting? And being sick, yeah. because I spent so much time being ill, yeah. and they allowed me to watch movies on TV. Oh, that may have been yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you've lived an entire life with a chronic illness. I got sick at six with probably what was rheumatic fever. And then, as you know from the last book, uh, at 12 is when the autoimmune stuff started. Yeah. So I retreated, I think, into these worlds of romance and fantasy. Well, I can well understand that. Escape, what else? As an escape. As an escape. Totally. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I become friends with Betty Friedan. Um, <laughs> as soon as I moved to New York, when I was just barely 30, I'm not sure Friedan and I would have become such close friends if the book which was called The Book in My Life, which my mother read when I was still a little girl. So The Feminine Mystique wasn't really my book, it was hers, mm -hmm. and it changed her life. And she went back to work. She hadn't worked since I was born. She'd worked before the war and through the war. And the book you know, was so important that my father would hold it aloft and he would say in his wonderful <laughs> deep voice, if it's not in the book, I don't have to worry about it. If it is in the book, I do. And he still carried his Southern accent, although he was very liberal, left-wing actually. Um, so that book, The Feminine Mystique, liberated my mother, not just from housework, which she abhorred, and I write about yeah. how much she abhorred it, but also from sadness uh, and grief and depression. And so I grew up with the notion that Friedan was such a positive force. So when I met her, I loved her. 
But it did it come this the thing about for Dan was it extended the community. So you had support. It was you know, it was like the consciousness raising groups that you feel right. the same as I feel. Oh, then maybe I'm not yeah. so wrong. And Betty had terrible asthma. I don't know if yeah. you knew that about Betty. She suffered bouts of debilitating asthma. She also had to take steroids, mm -hmm. as I have my whole life. And that was a tremendous bond between Fredan. Mm -hmm. And I remember in Sag Harbor one night, she was always so generous about my staying there. We, I was having a very bad, I happened to have respiratory stuff with this. And, I'm, and she just pushed the Kleenex box. Uh, and she didn't say a word. Yeah. Um, so there was this bond of illness as but well as how did you finally, how did you first meet her? You know, I'm not sure. I, I either met her through Cynthia Fuchs Epstein or through Linda Wolf. I, I, and it's unclear to me, but it was right away. Um, I met her right away. And it might have been at a meeting. I don't really know. But you did a lot of work about women, studying women. Well, and between. I was running a program. Yeah. Um, well, I was, when I f moved to New York City from Berkeley, California, it was to run a program on gender at the Russell Sage Foundation. So I was in the world of funding projects. Um, and I was very active, active as a mm -hmm, feminist. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd already. And writing, and writing. And you'd already been married once. Ah, uh, twice. Twice. Before. Yeah. Did you, no. did you? Yeah, this is, you know, romantic feminism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was the, the beautiful, the very handsome, dark-haired man? Left-wing man. Yeah. Yeah. He was a college sweetheart. Was he the second marriage? First. The first. First. And then the second one was also in politics. Um, actually, we met, I can't, we met, I think, in Friends of the Farm Workers. <laughs> and then we went on the road for George McGovern. Ah. Uh. We went on the road together for George McGovern an ill-fated campaign, <laughs> but we were, we were on the road for McGovern. Um, my but both second of husband were, and I were very political men. But they were first romantic attachments. Very romantic. Yeah. Very that didn't romantic. turn out too well. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had my third marriage, which was, which I write in yeah. the book, we'll just mention briefly, which I call Not a Fairy Tale. And the interesting thing about that marriage is that I was old enough and he was much, much older, as we know. I was old enough to know better, mm. but I still couldn't still let it go, Ronnie. Yeah. Do you still look for the prince? No. 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 And no. Um, but it's been a long, hard <laughs> road. And that's there. the last chapter of the book where yeah. I call, we need a slow love movement. <laughs> We've had a slow food movement. We need a slow love movement. Which means what? It means... It's not that jittery, oh, I'm in love, I'm in love, but that we learn someone. Mm -hmm. We learn their contours. And we don't expect them to be Prince Charming. And when I sit in the diner in my neighborhood and I see little girls, five and six, playing with all their plastic crap, their Barbie stuff, with the princess and the, you know, and the coach and the horses, and I think, we've not moved that far beyond this, have we? We've not moved beyond the princess bit. And so in that last chapter, I talk about the importance of that, letting it go, and learning that equality in the relationship can still be love and can still be romantic. And of course, Friedan never had a problem with romance and no, feminism. She liked it, right? And she wanted to love yeah, yeah. and to be loved. And, and be that loved, eluded yeah. her, as you know. So. So, so we you, looted her. You had Betty for Dan and I had Bella Abs. Uh, and they didn't always love each other. <laughs> it was always and I such loved a Bella too. Yeah. And I adored Bella. Yeah. And she was good to me. Yeah. Bella was good to me too. She she was they were both such major personages. But what I'm interested in is I mean, for Dan came to her book from her own experience, living through it. It wasn't a theory. It was an experience and a discovery, right? Then we have some books that are really theory. I mean, written by people who haven't really come to it from a living experience. And haven't, and haven't lived the activism. Yeah. And remember that Betty, like Bella, they both come from civil rights backgrounds mm -hmm. and advocating for civil rights. And I think the thing about Betty is that she understood that she was miserable and unhappy and from that misery, and also hating housework, um, and understanding that it really ought to be paid, whoever was doing it, right, and bored, and all that stuff, 
From that, she then wrote a book that had a lot of theory in it, but she didn't start with a theoretical mm -hmm. foundation. She started with what's going on here? Mm. And of course, it starts at her Smith reunion, mm. where she was asked to write a question, uh, to do a questionnaire. And the responses from so, her were so similar sisters, to how she felt. Were, uh -huh. She realized, wait a minute, everyone's <laughs> home and miserable. What's gone wrong? Mm. And so that's where we get the famous line, the problem without a name. But yeah, what, go back to when you said that both Betty and Bella, for instance, came with a already civil, a civil rights thing. Community you came, action. You came from that too. Your father was very liberal. My father was very liberal and his family, Jewish family, Jews in the South, yeah. um, they stood against what was then called mm -hmm. the color line. Mm -hmm. And when I was a little girl, my father sat me down and it was when Bella was a civil rights lawyer and with the hat and, yeah. you know, and he sat me down and he said, you could be her. Oh. That's what my father wanted oh. me to be. He oh. wanted me to be Bella Absinthe. Oh, so Wear cute. hats, you know, I yeah. was, you know, he was Jewish, yeah. she was Jewish, <laughs> I was Jewish, we were going to do this. So, and his admiration of Bella, my mother, when my mother got to read, meet Betty Friedan, it was one of the great moments of her life. But when my father, when I introduced my father to Bella, that was it. And of course, I organized a rapprochement of these two, of these two great women. Yeah. One fireworks day, one fireworks night. I think the thing that Ronnie, was a great scene. Yeah. Sitting in there. Yeah. At, what, what is it? The uh, Adirondack chairs, Adirondack overlooking, chairs. overlooking the bay and the Hamptons, <laughs> and watching Boys Harbor fireworks. <laughs> and I had managed with conspirators that neither one of them knew the other was going to be there. And then we just and we left them alone. But it, I was with Betty at Bella's funeral, and Betty was deeply upset. They they had grown old together in a way, except Bella was taken so much earlier. But the thing I think that joined them that people often forget is that they were both the daughters of Jewish merchants. <laughs> Bella's father was a kosher butcher. With the slogan of live and let live. He, and, was, he was a butcher. Yeah. And, cutting up the yeah, meat. Yeah, he was exactly. <laughs> and Betty's father was a, a Peoria jeweler. But the thing that they bonded over, of course, was the state of Israel. Yeah. And that was a thing that divided feminists in the world and women's rights people. But at the end of the day, they, the allegiance to Zionism, you see, that it wasn't a form of racism, that they hated each other and they fought. And then when they go to those UN decade meetings and there was this kind of bond, an ethnic bond, um, that was touching. Mm -hmm. In the book also, you talk about fairness and unfairness in that you really learned that from the chronic illness. Yeah. That was so interesting to me. How, what does that mean? I learned that life isn't fair and there are things that happen to people that they have no control over. And from that understanding that at a very young age, I would never be well. I somewhere had this little hope that I was going to be well, but I knew I wasn't gonna be well. And my parents' commitment to make me understand that wasn't the end of the world and that I ought to be looking at other people whose lives were much worse than mine. So in a way, they were tough, you know, they were kind of tough um, on me. And they didn't, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? They didn't give in to my whining. There was, in fact, when I would, you know, kind of do the boo-hoos, I couldn't do a sleepover and I couldn't do this, my father would say, would you care for a piece of cheese with that wine? <laughs> so there was no, there was great love, great toughness, and also the get yourself together, there are people in far worse shape than you are. They did a very good job. And the feminism really comes from my father as well as my mother, because he saw his mother, two aunts, and his sister go down the drain with Mm. the southern requirements of what a lady was, what a lady had to be. When I worked at Ms., there was a woman at, at Simmons College, I think, who did a study of successful women and the importance of having a very supportive father. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, I remember My that. father was as strong a feminist as my mother. Yeah. Yeah. They were a team. Friedan, as you know, in The Feminine Mystique, dedicates The Feminine Mystique to the new women and, and to men. the new men. Right. And they were that couple because mm -hmm. my mother read the book, my father was working 
two jobs. You know, he did. He owned nightclubs. He owned bars. He tended bar. I mean, he did what he needed to do. It wasn't what he had intended, but it's the way life turned out for him. And he was working very hard. At one point, he was working two jobs. I write about it. My mother got a good job, and she said, "That's it. You're not going to work anymore." Well, he'd worked from the time he was 14 or something, and he said, "Well, I well," and she said, "Oh no, this is the way it's going to be." So they really believed that Friedan was right, mm -hmm. you know. And Friedan mm -hmm. writes in that book that sure. men are having heart attacks and all of that pre-women mm -hmm. working stuff. So, so they yeah. did a very good job with you, because you certainly have pursued very interesting things, been very important, but also have lived with this chronic illness with great success. And I, I think the, the that. lesson of this is that they weren't easy. Yeah. They weren't easy. And it wasn't a fairy tale childhood, mm -hmm. but it was a real childhood. And the other thing is that my mother, as you know from the last book, always stood up to male doctors who mm -hmm. potentially could have harmed me. Mm. And she wouldn't let that happen. Good. No, let so let's happen. go back to Betty. Betty played a very important role. And she was more than just an author. She was an organizer. Yes, she was. So was Bella. Well, they all were, actually. Were. When you look at them all, the, yeah. the, if we're looking at the three, you know, Fergan, Steinem, and Abzug, <laughs> who would get together to form. Did they all do together with a political caucus? Well, Betty was, always, you know, Betty was always in danger of being thrown out, and she was often <laughs> thrown out because she couldn't control her temper. And she was then excluded. She was punished by exclusion. Um, and I write in the book... But and Bella I, had a terrible temper. Oh, but not as bad as Betty's. Uh, Bella's temper was volcanic, but it was about issues, if you remember. She would blow up because you didn't, you know. But Betty took it personally. She would, she would become angry in ways that people... Because she would say things that were wrong and inappropriate two people. And was Bella she was more worried different. about her standing than the other two? Is I she think, more basically insecure? I think she was lonely. You, what? Lonely. Yeah. I think there was a deep loneliness in her. And also there was, what do we call it when someone starts an institution? Founder syndrome. Betty had founder syndrome because she felt that she started the movement. And in many ways, she did. I mean, that was the first big rock out there in terms of a publication. And damn it, Ronnie, she wanted to be the mother of it all. Yeah. She felt she was, as I write, she felt mm -hmm. she was Susan B. Mm -hmm. She might be wearing leopard print sl <laughs> slacks and stiletto heels. But she felt that she was the mother of it all. And when she didn't feel that she would be properly Respected. Attributed, accredited and, with that, yeah. respected. She, she now had a little meltdowns, not so little. But I also have great compassion for the fact that she was taking steroids, she was taking mm -hmm. inhaled steroids, and, you know, it clouds one's judgment and <laughs> problems with impulse. Betty, however, the rage that Betty had always impressed me. Because when my mother was angry, and my mother could be very angry, I saw her anger as something that came from powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And Betty's anger, while it wasn't pretty, I saw it as a woman giving herself permission to be angry and clear the room or not. And I thought, wow. Did she recover quickly? Oh, and she'd come and ask for her your forgiveness. Yeah. And that, to me, was the, one of was the... Was the saving grace. Well, and endearing. Yeah. Here, is the, here is the mother of it all, yeah. if you will, at least for me, because she was in my life as, a, as mm -hmm. a name and a literary reality. And then she'd come, you know, she'd knock on the door the next morning after she'd stormed out of a dinner party, mm -hmm. and she'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know? <laughs> and, and how could you not love mm -hmm. her? Well, there were people who didn't. But I surely did. She was a second mother in a funny way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And when I was so ill, um, and I hid that from my mother, because my mother was 42 when I was born. Mm. Um, Betty was younger, mm. obviously. Of course, Betty died first. Mm. Um, mm. Betty really stood by me, came to the hospital, and, and later when she got sick, I, it was very much, for me, she was a mother. It's always funny when you think of the three of them are were very conscious of their appearance. Betty was certainly conscious of her appearance. Her jewelry. Right. Her, and her clothes. Her clothes. And her shoes. Yeah. And, and she wasn't beautiful. Never. But she was something about her, the way she moved and sat on it. I remember seeing her sitting on a couch, and she actually, I mean, I thought she really looked sexy. And 
You know, do you I'm know so what I'm glad saying? you brought that up because one of the things I so admired about Betty is that she wasn't pretty mm. in a traditional way. She had terrible battles with weight, something I certainly can sympathize with, but she was undeterred in her search for romance mm -hmm. and validation from men. And she thought she deserved to be loved, right. to be cherished, to be courted, yeah. to have love affairs, and good for her, yeah, good absolutely. for her. Absolutely. And I think from the beginning, if you look back at the feminine mystique now, so many years, mm -hmm. and 10 years since Betty died, she died 10 years ago this year. She's been gone 10 years. The seeds for her other great book, the Fountain mm -hmm. of Age and the whole dissection of how evil ageism is, actually they're in, the beginnings of that thinking are in Next the feminine thing. mystique. And I think about ageism, yeah. if I can shift just a little on oh, this. Oh, definitely. I think of ageism in this whole second, third wave stuff with the younger feminists. Let's talk about the second wave. I mean, do you feel you were in a part of the women's movement that's over? Well, apparently, if you ask the young ones, I don't and, understand. you know, throw, throw your mother under the bus is what yeah. I feel sometimes. I who named it the second uh, wave, do you know? I don't know, yeah. but I fought it, and now I don't fight it. But I think of us as a continuous stream of history that begins with suffrage. And now the young, the young women are doing something else. But the bitterness that they have toward us, that they say second waivers and they're third waivers, and I don't know what the very young millennials are going to say they are, but I'm worried about fighting over names instead of issues. Well, also, I think the discovery of uh, being a feminist and the discovery of different things is a continuous thing. And it, I, but it also it, goes back. Yeah. I mean, I have two daughters who were professionals. One is a lawyer and the other was a producer in new television news who stayed home with their kids. Right. And now they're starting to look for jobs again. Right. And, and some of them, they, both of them, they feel a little guilty that they were home. But they're under know, that pressure. Right. 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 And then my granddaughter, Sophie, just by the time I was reading your book, calls me from her college and says, can you tell me about Betty Friedan? Oh, I'll send her a copy <laughs> of the book. She's a freshman. She was oh, yeah. a freshman at Ken. So it's so interesting. It's a continuous thing. It's not a new thing. What I remembered is... Maybe we're getting a little expanded in our views. Yeah. Well, when I remember when women's literature was first being taught, I couldn't wait to read the, the older women's works. And whether it was Susan B. Anthony or learning the horror that, you know, there were these hidden women we didn't know about that we would never know about. Yeah. When... Um, Carolyn Halbrun this really brought May Sarton to yeah. light. Who wants to read May Sarton now? Yeah. Um, who reads Carolyn anymore? Right. Um, I worry. I went to a benefit for a young woman's organization. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> and the woman who was emceeing, and I paid money for my ticket. I didn't come free. <laughs> I paid. And the young woman that was emceeing this dinner <laughs> said, we're third waivers, and we've this, and we've that, and we, and I quote directly, we don't have to listen to the second wave anymore. We know everything they have to say. They were our mothers. And I thought, I'm not anybody's mother, but I think I'm going to find my way out of this. And I was so angry, and I talked to two or three women of my generation, of our generation, the second wave, and they said, oh, yeah, that's the way they are. So I think that there almost is a sense of be giving up to not engage. On the other hand, there are these very young ones um, that are still in college, and I think they're eager to, to read learn. and yeah. to learn. But I also remember the resentment of never being passed the microphone. Betty loved me, but she never passed the microphone to me. Oh, I had the same, <laughs> the same story with Bella. Yeah, the same and she story. loved you very and she much. She ran against me to be a co-chair of a platform. It's yeah. a whole long story, yeah. Yeah. but she didn't like my going out of my. No, and Betty adored me, and she supported my <laughs> writing, and she would always be looking for a proper husband for me um, or boyfriend. <laughs> but when it came to you know, she wouldn't pass the microphone, and so I understand that feeling. <laughs> but it shouldn't be about who gets the microphone. It should be about securing our rights. And when we hear some of the stuff that's being said on the you know, platforms, presumably of the Republican Party, I'm very worried 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm very worried about what's it goes back. It's constant yeah, and fighting. We, yeah, and, the, and also that nobody is really jumping up and down and saying this person on the Republican Party. I won't mention his name. I can't um, <laughs> because I really don't want to be sued for slander. <laughs> His views about women are misogynist, mm -hmm. and they're just, we need to keep saying that. And does no one care anymore? I don't know. We keep having to prove it. I mean, we need the, plat we need the, the solidity of a platform. We are equal to everybody else. It's a constant challenge to be that. It is. And one gets tired, but you can't stop. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. And you can't stop the relationship with a different generation. I mean, I... We can't be discarded by young people. We have a lot to or offer them. Or laughed at. Or laughed at. We have yeah, a lot to we offer. We do. And they have a lot to offer to they us. Ha and I want to learn from They've them. They've certainly been liberating. I want to learn from them. And I'm always proposing to the younger women, let's have an intergenerational I know that's an conversation. Yeah. I, I say it all the time. I want to have an intergenerational feminist dialogue. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I miss the mothers. I miss Bella. I miss Betty. Well, you're a mother now. It's a pass-along yeah. theory. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> I know? do. Yeah. You know? And I miss the writers like Elizabeth Janeway. Mm. You know? Yeah, I she miss was her. something, and, wasn't she? Yeah. yeah. And some of the activist writers like good old Jessie Bernard, who was right. very elderly when I met her. But she was tough and she was smart and she was an activist. So instead of this chopping. Yeah. Because we're one. a stream. We're a river. Exactly. You know, we're a river. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what are you doing now? I knew you'd ask me that. <laughs> Well, the very last public event Marilyn French ever went to um, before mm. she died was the party for Dancing at the River's Edge, and I was so excited that mm. I had actually finished that book. And on Marilyn's way out of the party, she screamed. She was in a wheelchair, yeah. all four foot eleven of Marilyn French. She screamed, don't be too happy, Alita. What's your next book? <laughs> and the truth of it is, I don't know, but I'm likely to circle back to feminism and disability because I think that that's something that needs to continue to be in the conversation, mm. women and disability. And I don't know if I've got what it takes to do another conversation about feminism, but if I did, what I would love to do is do something in collaboration with a young feminist. Yeah. But I refuse to call it a third waiver. Right, don't do that. <laughs> I right. won't do yeah. that. Well, Alita Bro, it's a great book. People should please read it. Do you have a website? I do. It's very simple. It's alitabrill.com. www.alitabrill.com. Thank you so much. Oh, Ronnie. <laughs> Good to be with you. Yeah. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Until